bit, but I don't want to keep people waiting. I'll just end the poll and then okay. in the interest of time, we'll just get things started. All right, so uh, thanks again for joining our, our third workshop. I'm happy 22, by the way, if I haven't talked to you yet this year. Um, so glad to have a uh, uh, number of speakers like Igor, Pavel, and, and Ryan. I, I know, Pavel, you have to, uh, uh, you don't, you're not able to stay the whole time. Um, but yeah, just a quick intro, and then I'll turn things over to Igor, our first speaker, and then we'll continue with our conversation. Um, first, I mean, just a quick reminder on the, on the code of conduct that we have in our community, which uh, we're, you know, which I like to remind people of, whether it's an in-person or a virtual meeting like this one. Uh, and some quick notes. Uh, I mean, like Igor noted, there's a lot of people that are joining for the first time. Uh, we haven't uh, participated in previous workshops. So some quick reminders. Uh, we have a Q&A tab in Zoom. Uh, if in, anytime you have any questions, I mean, feel, feel free to post them there. Uh, I mean, you'll, you'll see in the agenda, we, we have like a Q&A at the end, but I mean, don't feel like you need to wait until the end. And we'll actually pause like several times during the talk to answer your questions uh, as we, as the speakers cover uh, relevant sections. Uh, and then as we uh, notify uh, most of you via email uh, for people who are registered as of uh, yesterday afternoon, you know, my time in California, we have a Cube Cloud set up uh, for the demo and hands on lab, and you should be able to follow that. And let me uh, quickly show um, the Notion page that I sent out last, yesterday, and I'll post it on the chat. Uh, we have additional instructions uh, with code snippets that you can follow. Um, um, so there's a link on the chat. Uh, once when uh, Igor and Ryan are doing their demos, I mean you should be able to see, uh, you know, copy and paste those uh, code snippets on on Cube Cloud and follow along. I mean these features are, I mean everything that both both pre presenters will talk about are available both on Cube Cloud and open source version of our software. Uh, but we have the Cube Cloud set up. Because uh, it's just a handy way to just set up a lab environment, uh, so it's it, it's not like unique to Cube Cloud by any means. Uh, recording of the workshop. Um, I mean, obviously we're having issues with the live stream, but this is being recorded on my laptop, so I'll post it on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to rewatch, or uh, if people weren't able to attend today, and uh, within um, 24 hours or so, I'll be sending out a post event survey. Uh, we appreciate your feedback. Uh, including any future topics you want to see in future events. And, and then in the survey, if you'd like to receive a, a swag item that, that we procured for this event, uh, send us your like uh, address, phone number, so we can ship the item to you uh, as, a, as a token of our appreciation. Uh, so in terms of agenda, we have, uh, like I noted, Igor uh, will be covering the first half uh, uh, related to data schema. Um, and then, you know, we'll turn things over to Ryan, who will cover joins and query dependent data, and then we'll sort of wrap things up. Uh, but like I said, if, if you have Q&As, I've seen that people have already post, uh, posted questions here already uh, in the Q&A tab, but we'll try to answer them as we go along. Uh, so without further ado, Igor, I'll stop sharing so you can take control of the screen and uh, I'll, I'll let you run with it. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, uh, let's let's start. So yeah, hopefully you can see my screen now, right? Yep. So, oh, okay. So it should say like data schema design right now. Right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, okay. Let's let's start. So uh, I'll I'll try to like to start with covering the really really the basic things about about how to model data with cube it all starts with uh with how you create and uh, design your data schema because this is this is a mostly declarative uh, configuration that you use to basically map what you have in your data sources to to your business domain to the metrics that you, you would like to be exposed via the api so uh we are getting like I'm getting a lot of 
questions like on, on Slack and uh, like on other channels, like um, how to create create cubes, how to design a data schema that would you know um, provide the best developer experience uh, possible, or what is like the optimal design for for the data schema. So uh, I would say that probably um, it's a good idea for you to default to this rule. Of thumb. So uh, your data schema should reflect your business domain. It should contain entities uh, like cubes or its measures and dimensions, which naturally makes sense in a business domain. So if you look at the query inside your front-end application or inside a BI tool like Apache Supercent using the all-new Cube SQL API, uh, the query should read just naturally, uh, like maybe just plain English. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's probably ironic that, you know, uh, when SQL uh, came around, uh, you know, it was designed to be the language that can be understood naturally. Uh, now those times are like long gone with many like uh, dialects and extensions and uh, functions that we need to, you know, look up in the databases. However, Q brings us times back. So uh, uh, Q, Cube queries, which uh, which are expressed like in Cube SQL syntax or in the JSON syntax that you use with Cube's REST API, uh, most of the times they read naturally. And if you designed your data schema that it is so, then you're on the right track. So here I'm showing you an example of a of a query which which I've just directly taken from our like internal analytics app at kubedev. So basically uh, we're using this query uh, with some front end that visualizes the result set. We're using the, this query to, uh, to know uh, how, many, how many users visit a certain page in the documentation and, and how that's evolving uh, over time. And, and as you can see uh, from the filter section here, uh, we are mostly interested in, and we are mostly comparing two particular pages, like like their getting started page on Docker and the getting started page on Node.js. And well, uh, I think that it's pretty much understandable from 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 this query that we are talking about like a collection of uh, a collection of uh, hits to our different pages of our website. We're speaking of. Uh, count there about paths that you attend, and I would say that this, uh, these terms and this definition, they mostly uh, reflect uh, how we reason about about the data, how we analyze it. But 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 it has really, really little uh, relation to the data layout in their data source that we uh, where we store this data. Yeah, and. Uh, there's also another very, really, really common question, uh, like uh, how should cubes map to different tables in your data source? Uh, and uh, like the rule of thumb for that is that, well, it depends. And if you default to um, having your cubes and measure measures and dimension in them reflect your business domain, then the Flexibility that Cube provides should be in, should be enough, and it is enough uh, to uh, make sure that there are elements that are exposed through your API they, they are in a business domain, but the cubes that you that you create they map to um, basically any entities entity out there. So it can be a single table, like with a with a really really basic example like select star from table. And it can be anything else, like a union of tables, some some joint statement that you decided to um, to model your cube over, and also uh, any type of F SQL expression. So uh, here are a few examples of that, and all of all of these are legit examples. You you should feel uh, like no issue um, defining your cubes over over tables mapping one, one, one by one, and also over unions or arbitrary SQL expressions. Uh, the end goal here is to make sure that the measures and dimensions that you'll be putting into your query, they naturally make sense for you and for other folks in your development team. 
And here's even a more complex example, which, which provides an insight that, well, uh, indeed, there are SQL uh, expression that you model your coop over it can be can be quite complex maybe maybe this is not the most complex example of that and maybe not the com most complex example that you have in your real world data schemas but an interesting thing here is that uh there uh, the expression the typical expression that this cube is modeled over um is used to clean up the data uh that's that's stored in the original data source so uh you as as a developer might not have like full control over uh what's happening in your data warehouse or database it might be owned by another team or the data layout there might be uh affected by you know a whole bunch of reasons uh like maybe 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 you have some legacy data pipeline uh, that that puts the data in some particular way. However, with Cube, uh, uh, most of the time you you can um, define you define your Cube uh, in a way that uh, all that complexity of that kind of legacy or or any data layout is hidden from the end user because you're able to well to use arbitrary SQL statements. And in case in in rare case that uh, this flexibility is not enough, or in a case that you would like to um, change your data layout before consuming it from Cube, you can use other tools uh, like DBT to uh, to process your data and to transform it into into the data layout that you would like to see uh, in your SQL expressions in Cube. And there are many tools and many ways for you. Uh, to simplify how you how your data schema is defined and those tools uh, are available at different levels so let's start with the most basic level and i would say with the, the most natural level as uh, cubes are defined over sql statements so uh, sql as the language provides you uh, with so-called common table expressions which are which are basically ways to uh, create or like an intermediary representation of some data. Uh, reference it uh, in the next query. So CTEs provide you with a way to simplify your definitions, to make them more concise, to split them, to contain multiple steps, and uh, this improve the maintainability of your data schema. So here's, uh, again, a real world example that I've just direct, directly taken from uh, from our internal analytical app, uh, where we are using the so-called count table expression on the top, starting with with the with statement, uh, it has a name like user's first message, and basically is defined over some select statement, and then uh, we use another CTE, and eventually, in in the last like three lines of this code example, we are just uh, referencing those two. Um, cities to to create like a, a joint and joint table which 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 this cube is defined over obviously there is there's no problem like combining this in a single complex statement however understanding what's going on here uh would be much more complicated in that case and now we now we will go like one level of abstraction um above and 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 explore what you can and do on the JavaScript level. Uh, level. So Cube's data schema, uh, it's defined using like just basic JavaScript syntax, and uh, uh, many tools that, that are available in JavaScript are also uh, of help uh, to you when you define your data schema. So uh, uh, you should feel free to um, introduce some constants that you might be reusing in your data schema and maybe even put them putting them into like separate files that you can import and reference and, and that's not, not only true for 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 constants you can do the same for uh, for functions and import them and call them in your data schema code so so uh, so you're able to eliminate code duplication and uh, again improve the maintainability of the 
uh, of their uh, of the data schema. And uh, um, I, I would like to expand on this, uh, just commenting on a, on a question that that I've seen in the registration uh, survey for this workshop. Um, you know, one of the developers asked if how how should they handle the situation where they when when they have like this uh, kind of single or uh, unified like data schema but uh two distinct data sources uh which well uh, which store the same data but 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 some of their measures and dimensions require you using like sql uh like specific sql func functions which which are like basically named differently uh in, in those in those databases while well, abstracting uh, parts of of those like dimension and measure definitions using using functions and uh, and uh, like like running or executing the right function based on their data source it might be the way to go here okay and right now we will go once one step more in this ladder of abstractions and uh, and explore what's available at the cube level at the like most high level here, uh, to again to to provide you with tools to simplify and uh, uh, your data schema and reuse the code. And there are plenty of those uh, of the of those uh, methods available. So uh, in Cube, uh, for any for any Cube that you have defined you can reuse the entire SQL statement of that cube in another cube. And in a minute, we'll see an example of that. What you also can do is to, is to say, hey, I wanted this cube to be a complete copy uh, of, the, of, of another cube, but some, some of their members like measures or dimensions or joins or segments or pre-aggregations will be substituted by, by something else. And this is called, this is called extension or inheritance in cube and also um, you, you, you can you can use a, like with, with a combination of those you can use a, a, a very specific technique called polymorphic polymorphic cubes uh, to, um, to simplify your code in certain use cases so here is an example of how you can reuse the complete uh, SQL expression from from one cube in another one so uh, here again, this is a real-world example uh, from our internal analytics, where we have some data uh, transferred via an ETL job from GitHub and and stored in in a data warehouse. And here we we have defined this cube called contributions because the data that we have in the warehouse is basically the GitHub issues and GitHub pull requests data. And and then uh, we'd like to well maybe come maybe calculate how, how many uh, developers contribute, co contribute code to Cube uh, on GitHub. And uh, here we are doing so by defining the contributors group directly over uh, the contributions. So, uh, so that, that's a way uh, to simplify your code because otherwise you would probably need to call Five flights of of that code and make sure that everything is synchronized once uh, your once your code changes. Okay, and here's here's the last code example. Uh, it's it's about uh, the so uh, the so-called polymorphic uh, cubes. So here we can see that there is there is a cube defined over over a table, but well, not all users are. Equal. Uh, some of them are, have spe specific roles, like 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 an admin role, and also um, some of them might have like other attributes. Like some users might be might be banned from user uh, using our website or web service. So uh, here I defined uh, two more two more cubes called admin users and blocked users, and. Uh, this is just just another another moment when you can reiterate on the idea that your cubes most probably should reflect what reflect your business domain. So, um, so here, uh, here you can see that um, uh, admin users and blocked users. 
well, they, they contain a subset of data which is already so available via the user's cube. However, you might have another cubes uh, which might uh, which might uh, have relations to 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 to, to these ones, like. Like maybe some maybe somewhere you have something like admin user permissions, uh, or you might have uh, like user users blacklist, and those uh, those cubes might have might be joined to these ones. And any and if you define if you use if you use polymorphism, and if you define uh, such cubes as admin users and block users you will be able to well to to join those cubes naturally and also um, and also make sure that the queries which you run through your api they are they are making sense okay so these were like the very basics of 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 how to model your data so you're using data schema you're trying to make it uh, like very 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 um very very good in terms of your business domain, so it so it naturally so it, so it, so the queries can be naturally read, and uh, you're modeling your cubes over well basically any kinds of SQL expressions, like like from a single table to really arbitrary SQL expression, and uh, you're using tools on the SQL level, at JavaScript level, and the cube level to simplify your data schema, split it into parts, make them reusable, and improve the maintainability. And with that, I would like to hand it yeah. over to Ray. Yeah, let's pause here for a second. Uh, there are, I mean, thank you, for every, thanks for Igor, first of all, and then thanks uh, for all the attendees for, for posting a lot of questions. Uh, I think we answered most of them online. Um, I mean, there are a couple of questions that I, I wanna highlight in particular, one from uh, Ian about what are we using to get web metrics into the database in the first place? And I mean, thanks, like a Pavel, for um, uh, for for suggesting your answer. Uh, I mean, basically, our pipeline is built on top of BigQuery, and we're using custom event collector hosted by GCP Cloud Functions. Hopefully, that that makes sense. And uh, Pavel and Igor, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. Um, and the the second question, uh, I, mean, I guess it's an anonymous attendee. Is it recommended to operate cubes out of OLTP? Um, and I mean, the answer is if, if the question is, can you use cube on top of OLTP database or RDBMS? And the short answer is yes. Uh, well, I mean, we obviously have support for Postgres. Like Igor, I don't know if you want to expand on that answer. Or, or Pavel, I mean, feel free to as well, but just wanted to sort of highlight those as, as two questions that, that we answered uh, in the Q&A um, and go, go ahead, Igor. I would, yeah, I would probably dig deeper like in, in, in here. So uh, yeah, one of the good sides of Cube is that it, it, it can be connected like to one or more like data sources that are, can, can be either like RDBMS, like traditional databases and also data warehouses uh, they're well they're you you should you, you're probably very much very much aware and hence hence was your question that OLTP is uh, OTP databases the uh, well my might be limited uh, in 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 the performance that they, that they can provide because you know they are they uh, they uh, well, might 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 have some limitations, like for concurrency, and uh, the good news here is that, uh, well, this cube, you're not directly querying your databases when you have your like pre aggregations set up, which is, well, recommended for all production use cases. Uh, their pre aggregation data in is stored in Cube Store, which is like which is created for 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 you know. Performance and allows for high concurrency. So their the queries which will be incoming into your API, they will they won't hit their um, raw data in your data source. So they'll hit Cube Store, which contains your pre-aggregated data. So um, you'll you'll be able to serve your queries like 
100 100 queries per second no problem even more uh, and uh, and that can scale well almost uh, indefinitely like within reasonable bounds and uh, uh, and cube will take care of uh, refreshing your pre-engations and uh, pulling your database uh, at in, you know and uh, and uh, we have we have we have some some options and settings uh, to make sure that your your database um, doesn't get like overloaded, <laughs> and uh, you know I, I would even say that we have like Cube has like really really sane defaults that uh, you know basically uh, basically means you, you you don't have to tinker with those options because everything works out of the box. So you just define your data schema with pre-agations and you start querying your your like your API with arbitrary concurrency, or, uh, and you get like great performance while while your old TP database functions um, predictably and you know without any hiccups. Cool, thanks. And a couple more live questions. Uh, there is one from anonymous attendees, and I think this is like a topic that Ryan you'll cover in a bit. What's the difference between writing join in the SQL versus joining cubes uh, using cube joins? I, I think that's what you'll talk about. So we'll yep. sort of skip that for now. Uh, the other question from Dylan, uh, curious on what the data schema should look like in a database slash data warehouse before setting up KubeJS schema. Should we follow like a star snowflake style schema in our database outside of Cube? Like Igor, like that's, I'll let you take that. Yeah, that's but. yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. I would say that um, in many cases it would be. Really good, to, you know, if your data layout is like, already reflects or like the star schema or snowflake schema. Yeah, it's 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 probably there, like most expected data layout. If you're if if you're doing uh, like some analytics, uh, but if not, if it's not the case, I would probably um, start with you know with with, with like modeling the data schema anyway. Uh, because well, it allows you to you know to get started uh, quick and uh, you know iterate, iterate after that. And only in case uh, that your data layout like, disallows you from from certain things, I'm not sure what that might be. My, my, maybe your data schema gets like overly complex with like many uh, many cubes, like uh, may, maybe intermediate cubes that you use you know to to make joins, or you you just don't like the, the look of it. Then probably some investment into Relay out in your your data in the you know database or data warehouse uh, might be worth it, but again, I would I would probably default to working with with the data that you already have, uh, and uh, yeah, using the flexibility of uh, of Cube of JavaScript and SQL to to model your, your cubes over over that. Another another you know uh, reason for you to relay out your data might be. Uh, might, might be performance. So yeah, in 99% of the cases, uh, just defining the pre aggregations and uh, you know setting setting them like in the right way, like like uh, using incremental pre aggregations for time series data, using partitions for your pre aggregations, it 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 allows Cube to build your pre aggregations in in efficient manner and to provide you with great performance. However, sometimes, uh, especially when uh, when Cube is used with some databases that were not designed for performance, like like maybe some misconfigured, um, like MySQL instance, uh, with a, like when you have like large amount of data, it it might it might be worth it to really out your data. But but again, most probably if you're if if you're asking this question, you're not like working with uh, you know. Some traditional database, more or less. I assume that you might be working with data warehouse, and then the question is, well, kind of irrelevant. Yeah, we'll yeah. take one more question before we move back to the content. This one from Madeline. Uh, you gave many examples of doing fairly complex SQL in the cube schema itself. Can you speak to when it would be more efficient to do that work outside of cube? Um, yeah, for example, oh, right. in ETL pipelines that land the data in pre-made tables that Cube could point to. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't fully get the question. So, so, so the question is uh, about whether, whether those like transformations on those, those like uh, SQL expressions should be at the Cube site or at the ETL site. Uh, yeah. I would say that, uh, well, 
probably the answer would be along the lines that I that I that I've just given like the, in the previous question. So I mean, uh, um, what we're doing at Cube, we're trying to provide you with a developer tool to you know to 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 help you to help you like do your job more efficiently, easier, and uh, ship features like in, for the app you're building faster. So so I would probably default to to the way that which allows you to you know to to do that to do, to, to to ship features faster. So if if you feel like uh, you know slightly changing your like ETL pipeline uh, would allow you to define your data schema quicker and, and you know get 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 your API um, up and running like uh, quicker again go for it uh, if you feel like like you you're already uh, you know familiar with cube. Uh, at a certain level, or if you feel like the the examples that I was showing in there in this in this workshop are like are those ones that, that that allow you to progress, then probably probably uh, the best way would be just just to leave data as it as it is and and just just define your data schema and transform all, all data in the cube in the cube side, uh, and then and then use pre aggregations to. To allow the data to be transformed by Cube in this efficient internal representation, like the aggregations data uh, that Cube will use to serve your API queries in a fast manner. And uh, I think I, I, I think I, I just see another question about um, about DBT. So uh, so yeah, I've just mentioned that you know tools like dbt might be used to transform data before feeding it to cube uh, and yeah the question the question is about like uh, about about a way to auto automatically update schema changes once uh, some um, the data layout is changed upstream like like you, like like when you uh, rename or, or add a column in the dbt model um, uh, yeah, the the good news here is that we are we are working on DBT integration right now, and uh, we'll be shipping it this quarter. I think there is there is an issue on GitHub which you can just yeah find I, I by, posted by uh, yeah I posted that already oh, the cool. answer so all right I yeah think please we follow have, that issue yeah. so we, it looks like we uh, yeah I think let's move on to back to your slides and I think we got about 20 minutes for the like, two other sections you have. So we'll, I'll let you run with it again. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, so now we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, about um, a little bit more complex concepts uh, of the data schema. Uh, this is our, like how the data schema is compiled, um, whatever that means and how the data schema is versioned inside Cube. And, you know, it might sound complicated, but these are like really, really, really basic concepts. Um, so um, let's, uh, let, let, let's talk about the gist of it. Well, um, the idea is that the data schema that you provide like in your, in the in in the in the, in the files uh, with JS extension inside the schema folder, uh, they are not used by Cube just exactly as they are like on disk. Um, Cube um, turns um, applies like like really really slight transformations um, to the data schema and uh, translates or in other words compiles it into an internal representation. And uh, later I'll. I'll tell more about this. What Cube also does, it caches the result of data schema transformation internally, and uh, Cube does this for performance. As you as you probably know, or as you'll learn later, your data schema might be quite complex. It can also have external dependencies, like your data schema might be uh, downloaded and updated like from external API, and that means that well. You can't be sure how much time it takes to, you know, to update the data schema to download its contents if it's if they are if they are indeed downloaded from an API, and uh, in both those cases, uh, it's really it's re it's really great to have this data schema um, cached and easily accessible accessible uh, by Cube uh, because uh, the this kind of 
ready to be used for presentation of the data schema is crucial for Cube to be able to understand like um, and make sense of the queries which are coming into the API. Uh, like, as you know, the queries contain these measures and dimensions and segments and filters. Uh, and, uh, and also the, there might be like an order statement and to be, to, 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 be, to be able to make sense of that, to really understand uh, what are you querying, uh, Cube uses a data schema. So uh, having data schema um, compiled and readily available is crucial for Cube to, to serve your requests. So, um, so it means that when you're and when, when if the first request like hits hits cube, uh, it makes sure that it has the data schema like compiled and readily available, and um, then it caches it forever. Well, actually, you can have like a full control over it. Uh, there is this option or an extension point that you can provide your own function to called schema version, and if you put this into your cube.js file. Uh, you can fully control uh, like how Cube recompiles your data schema. Basically, uh, what Cube does, it, uh, it, it you know, runs this function every time a new, um, a new query is incoming, and it also respects your uh, multi-tenancy settings uh, doing, doing so. And only if that value has changed, Cube invalidates the compiled data schema and uh, you know you know compiles it once again and if and if it's needed to be updated from external data source uh keep does that so let's do a quick demo here to demonstrate um that indeed the data schema compilation happens uh when you're querying cube and uh, how the schema version affects uh affects the, the compilation of the data schema. So uh, yeah, here I have my here I have my screen, the slides and also and also just a quick note here that uh, we have this uh, data modeling workshop prep guide with different code snippets and you can feel free just to follow along. I'll be using the snippets just listed here. You can you can be copying and pasting them. Uh, into your Cube Cloud instances. So uh, there is this uh, Cube Cloud deployment that I've set up for this workshop. Uh, everything that I'll be, be showing to you works uh, with Cube in open source. Uh, in, uh, by the way, I use Cube Cloud to you know to just streamline what's happening here, just just to to show every everything and uh, everything like in a more efficient manner. So. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm going to do is to well enter the development mode because well I have some some code in my data schema commented out and I would like to uncomment it. So um, here's a data schema, and uh, let's take a look at the cube.js file. So uh, right now this file is like really basic; everything is commented out. So so uh, like we we are dealing with we really really uh, like default configuration of cube so uh let's go into development playground and uh, well run some queries what about uh, well querying for you know the count of line items whatever that is um let's run this query okay something's happening and then we should be we should be able to see the result okay uh some dot some data is fetched what about Trying some other query like like maybe a count of product categories, uh, you know, just 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 one measure. Okay, we have some result and it is ten. Cool. Let's go at this queries tab and inspect uh, those queries. So I've run two queries and uh, we can see here that the first query well took some time to to be run and you can. You can switch to the request span tab here uh, to understand what steps were taken to run that query. So you can see that request that, that load request span, also like REST API request query started. You know, there was no there were no, no cached cached data and uh, so on and so forth. So 
uh, we are seeing a lot of steps here, but we don't we don't, but we don't see a, a step for for schema compilation because well it was cached. Uh, let's inspect uh, another query. Oh, sorry. Let me yeah. Here are the product categories, and again we can we can we can inspect what's what's happening in here, and we're just seeing query started uh, using cache. Okay, uh, here here are the steps. But here uh, here is the question: What would happen if we update the cube.js file uh, with this code snippet? So what we have here, uh, we are defining there, well, redefining the, like the, the default uh, implementation of the schema version extension point with a function that every time it is called returns a string representation uh, of a random number. So, so basically it is zero dot something something. And, uh, and next time you call it, it's zero dot something else. So I'll save, this file uh, wait for for the api to be to be restarted and and go in the playground uh, well once again let's run some queries and and see what what's what ha what's happening there so so yeah we have some other, some some more cubes like products count let's let's run a query like this yeah so so we've got some data but, but, but now if you go to the query tab and look for the stats for the products count uh, query, uh, we'll see in the request spans that there is this step, which is at the very, very, very beginning uh, on, uh, of their you know, request span ladder. So here we're seeing the, the recompiling schema step uh, and well, Fortunately, it took only like zero milliseconds. Well, okay, this is this is because our data schema is really really um, simple at this point. We we only have just a few schema files. Most of them are really really trivial, and uh, well, uh, the schema compilation takes just you know uh, less than less than a millisecond. However. Um, in other cases, when your schema depends on external data source, uh, the schema compilation might, might take much, much more time. And uh, in that case, it would be it would be great, you know, to well to, to take to take to take care of what's happening when your query is executed by inspecting request spans, and also and also uh, make sure that you're you're not using like like <laughs> like dummy implementations of schema version uh, like this, uh, but uh, but but maybe but, but maybe using you know other other implementations which 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 might, might be querying you know an, a, a remote endpoint uh, to make sure that uh, to make sure that 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 that, that uh, to know if your schema has updated. So. Uh, here was the first demo that I would like to make, and uh, let's let's get back to to the next concept. So let's talk about compilation. It might be it might be overly like, complex to call it compilation, but what what Cube does, it substitutes the content of your uh, SQL expressions uh, uh, by replacing them like from strings to functions. This is done though, so Cube is able to substitute the and the names for for the tables and uh, and columns uh, in, in in your uh, in the generated SQL expression with the right with the right entities from the data schema. And uh, basically, the thing to consider here is if you're defining measures or dimensions out, outside of your data schema code, every SQL expression that you have should be like manually compiled or just defined as a function, not as a string. Well, if it's not so, you'll get uh, you know um, you get an error by, from Q, but yeah, it's it, it's good to be aware of it. So uh, at this point, I'll show you just just another demo um, of how, how how you can follow this uh, follow this rule. So uh, let's uh, let's inspect what we 
have in this orders cube. So this is really like a basic cube that, that shows some orders. And uh, as we can see in the developer playground, our orders um, have different, uh, different statuses. So uh, yeah, we can, we can query for statuses and we can see that, well, indeed, uh, there are different ones and also um, yeah, and, and, and also uh, the number of uh, orders we have we have in different statuses well it's always it's quite you know it's quite different okay yeah so but may, may, maybe maybe the difference is not that much okay so what what will you do if you wanna um, if you wanna Mm, no, uh, like may, may, maybe not the total count of orders, but the total count of orders in some specific uh, state, like total shipped orders. Most probably you'll, you'll write a code like this, like, like count with this filter. Yeah, it's quite obvious. Uh, and what would you do if, you, if you'd like to, you know, to calculate the, the share or percentage of of orders in some specific state. Well, most probably you'll just define this um, um, calculated measure, which just you know uh, divides one one measure by another. Okay, so I'm I'm saving I'm saving our changes. I'm going to to the playground just to test this newly added um, measures. Okay, so we have uh, well percentage of shipped. Cool. I'll I'll go ahead and run this query. Okay, if you view this as a table, well, we'll see that, well, percentage of ship query uh, is 100% for the orders in ship state and, you know, 0% for, for this another, in a, in a, in a, with another statuses. And if I remove there this dimension from here, yeah, we'll see this is just, you know, 33% 30, makes sense. However, uh, most, if you'd like to, you know, in your to add into your application, like the percentage of, you know, completed um, orders, the percentage of orders in in, in other in, in other statuses, well, one way for you might be to just copy and paste, uh, copy and paste your code to, you know, to um, tinker with it here and there to to change it. However, well, this is the code duplication that we as developers well, don't like. So uh, what would be a more like optimal way to, to achieve that? Uh, mm, yeah, let's let's do it like this. I'll just, com I'll just completely remove the measures for now. But yeah, as the developers, uh, uh, we would probably like to define the array of our statuses here and then uh, create some helper functions that would allow us to uh, define those measures dynamically so uh, let's uh, let's consider this function create total status measure. Uh, yeah, we can pass a, a we can pass this function and just simply get you know uh, an object. Well, its name or is a key in this object which has its type and which has its filter, which is well the same status equals some some specific status. I think to take a look here is that this SQL statement just you know basically defined as a lambda here and you provide your 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 you have this cube uh, variable as an argument to your function which you can use to refer to, to so cube is able to substitute this with your table name later or uh, or like Maybe with, a, with, with, some, with something else. Well, it depends how Q, it depends how complex your data schema is, and Q, and this is enough for a cube to to compile it correctly. Yeah, and this and this function basically uh, does the same for the percentage uh, for the percentage for every status. And it, the SQL expression here is also just a, um, just a, just a function. So yeah, uh, I'll. I'll I've, Everything that we need at this point is just is just to add our measures back. We are we are basically calling these functions for for every status and merging the resulting measures into our data schema. Yeah, and again, take note that 
SQL statements are functions now because they are uh, these measures is, are defined outside of the data schema, like outside of this, like outside of this cube uh, function. Okay, so what would happen if we go to the playground? Well, uh, yeah, we'll see this message that well, name of our measure changed. That's that's right. Uh, but now we see a whole bunch of different measures defined here, like percentage of processing, percentage of completed. So so yeah, we can we can go ahead and create create those. Well, let's see. Yeah, it works. So uh, we 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 are getting some result here. So uh, here's here's what you what you should should be you know thinking about like. With regard to schema compilation, if you're using some helper functions, if you're defining your measures and dimensions and whatnot outside of the, the special cube function, just take care to pre-compile the schema yourself by substituting uh, the string uh, values of, of the SQL um, expressions with functions which use a special cube variable that allows you to properly reference other elements of your data schema. And uh, well, that's it for, for this section. And uh, yeah, I wonder if you should pause for to take some questions or just go ahead and uh, with, with the next uh, section. What do you yeah, think I think we, yeah, I think we should just keep going because uh, you just have like a one more section and a demo, right? And then uh, I think most yeah. of the questions have been answered anyway. So yeah, let's keep going. Cool. Okay. So uh, yeah, and this is, this is uh, you know the last section that I'll cover, but this is you know my favorite one. So uh, as I said uh, before, uh, you know so often your data schema is just defined as plain files in, in, inside the schema folder that you're using from Cube. However, uh, your data schema, your cubes might have external uh, dependencies. It can you know uh, require some external data source like 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 an API API endpoint. Uh, that can be used to, uh, well, to to read the contents of your data so, uh, of, your, of your of your schema. It is, uh, well, it's it's quite a real world use case because, well, uh, you might have like a really like, complex app. You might it might be multi tenant. You might have um, different users configuring uh, their measures and dimensions that they would like to 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 see in the app. If that's the case, that most probably you'll have like a separate meta store for these uh, settings uh, specific for for each user uh, but then the question is how would you consume those settings from 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 cubes data schema to to define your data schema dynamically and uh, well cubes provide full full support for that and uh, and uh, what what you what you can what you can do is just it's just it's just you know write some JavaScript code to fetch the data from, from, from API or maybe to read it from some location and disk, uh, which is, you know, a more rare use case. Uh, but uh, the only thing you should know is that that code, which, which does some, some job uh, to, to create your data schema asynchronously should be wrapped up into this async module um, service function. And, uh, and yeah, uh, since since this uh, the parts of the data schema that you would most probably um, download from an API or read from like you know bare JSON file on, on your disk, uh, they will be defined outside of the special cube functions that we just talked about. They would need to be compiled uh, in a way that we just just talked about uh, by yourself. But again, this should not be you know, overly complex. So here's another demo about using this module function. So yeah, let's uh, let's take um, it's called async cube, well, <laughs> and it uses this async module uh, function. Uh, yeah, let's see what it does. It's really it's really simple. So as the first uh, the first statement here, uh, we just have this fetch function. Which is important, which is just standard, you know, uh, which is available here. And uh, yeah, and uh, you know, you might wonder if any NPM 
packages available in Cube Cloud or or you know whatever wherever you run Cube. In case of Cube Cloud, uh, only like whitelisted uh, um, uh, packages are allowed. So you know um, you you should not worry about like just any arbitrary code to being able to be inserted into into your data schema. So so yeah, here we are fetching data from some from some external endpoint. Well, let's explore what's what's there. I have uh, my my code editor here, which is you know just just VS Code with a really really simple uh, app, uh, which is an Express JS app, which defines this uh, endpoint, just just root endpoint, uh, and from that endpoint will serve will serve JSON. Which is returned by the generate cube function, and what this function does, it just basically provides an, an object with a title, with some SQL definitions, with the, with measures and dimensions. Well, it should probably look look familiar. And here I have um, here I have my 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 terminal where this uh, this, this script is running already at their port three three thousand, and here I have. Uh, this utility co uh, called local tunnel, which I use to uh, to expose this um, this URL to, to to the world. So uh, here it is. Let's go back to our browser. Um, check check uh, what data is returned from from that endpoint. Well, it's just the same uh, JSON we have in our app. Cool. Okay. So. Uh, this is some JSON. So we know that here, here in the Cube Cloud, we'll get just the same JSON. Uh, yeah, we can, we can, yeah, make sure this is this is this is the right uh, URL. Okay, what else? Uh, we are, we are we are taking the data that we we've, we've just fetched from that endpoint and using it to to create a cube. So here's the title. We also uh, we're also putting like the SQL statement in here, uh, yeah, and and also there are like dimensions and measures. But take a look, we are not like directly inserting them, but using this transform dimensions and transform measures functions, um, well, to apply to some transformations. You can go ahead into you know our docs to to you know uh, to get the contents of those functions. Uh, but yeah, what they basically do. Yeah, what they basically do, let's just go to the utils file and see um, uh, what they basically do is like applying some, you know, uh, some tra transformation. So for, for here we can see in the source code for, them, for the for SQL properties or SQL and drill members properties for measures, uh, there the string, uh, the, the, the string representation of that, of that expression will be converted to to function so this is basically what i've just just been told you uh this kind of pre-compilation of strings into um in, into functions and yeah uh let's let's now see how how this all works so uh, we should probably once this code code is right we should probably see another cube called i hope you remember that uh i think you Okay, I'm saving the code right now and the API is restarting. I'm going to the playground and yeah, let's let's see what, what we got there. Yeah, yeah, so let's scroll down. Oh, we have an async cube here. Uh, again, there is no static cube called async cube defined in the data schema, but uh, somehow, we are able to to run a query and see yeah uh, the count is three. We also have the donation code name, which basically reflects this dimension. Okay, let's run the query once again. Yeah, okay, we have Alice, Bob, and Eve here. Uh, yeah, so this is a way. Like, uh, uh, I believe it's really simple and straightforward. This is the way you can. Um, not only consume your data schema from, from, from files uh, on disk, but also uh, query an external API and make your make your schema really dynamic. And, and yeah, make sure make, make, make sure to not only 
not only use that sync model function, but to, well, if you have a multi-tenant app to, to define your multi-tenant properties and also uh, and also define the schema version of the kubejs file properly. Well, not like, not like this one, but probably querying again, uh, querying your API and uh, and checking if 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 the data your data schema is based on is really updated. So uh, he, he, that that was that was the third demo, and with this, I'm just handing this over to you, Ray. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Igor. Awesome. So and uh, cool demos, and they all work, which is always nice. So and. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think most of the questions, I mean, thanks, Ryan, for like helping address a lot of the questions that were questions about like a SQL API features and, and, and a few others. Um, but I mean, in the interest of time, like I think we budgeted about 20 minutes for your section anyway. So we'll like jump into your section. And then, Igor, I think there was a question on security context that if you can help answer like on the Q&A, that would be cool. And then. Yeah, I mean, Ryan, I'll, I'll let you take it away. That's good. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Share this. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about joins, which I know is a pretty hot topic for us in the Cube community. Um, just a little bit about the basics of joins for some of you who are new to Cube. So you can think of joins. Um, pretty much uh, analogously to how you think of joins in SQL. So just as how we tend to think of uh, cubes as tables and in the SQL analogy, you can think of joins as uh, the way to join uh, data across cubes. Um, so uh, that's, that's how we think of them. And I'll just show as well quickly uh, as well what this join looks like. So here's the joins block in a given cube. Uh, and I have defined here joins between this, this cube line items and, and another cube called products, as well as one called orders. Um, so that's the basic structure of one. You have a relationship as well as the, the SQL condition to do the join. Um, to note, all, all joins are left joins. Um, so whichever cube has that join defined on it is effectively the, you can think of as the main table in that relationship. Um, and then there's three options for which joins can have. So has one, the simplest, that's basically one-to-one -one mapping, um, say between a, a user ID and a user name, let's say. Um, and a has many relationship would be uh, where one, uh, one, let's say user ID has mapping to uh, user actions. And that's, that's and so you have several uh, actions that map to that user ID uh, or belongs to is, is the opposite of a has many. Um, every join statement you should note uh, must have at least one primary key. So a primary key is uh, set on a dimension within a cube. Uh, and each cube can have up to one primary key. Um, you can create, you can get kind of creative with your primary keys. If you need to incorporate more than one dimension, you can essentially create a composite uh, primary key, uh, but it has to map to one dimension within a cube. The other thing to note uh, with joins is that uh, the transitive property will apply across multiple joins. So let's say you have a join between cube A and B, as well as a join between cube B and C, then that join between A and C will be recognized as valid if you have a query that, that looks for data across those two cubes. Um, and I believe we use uh, Dijkstra's algorithm to find the optimal join path between uh, those cubes in case you're curious as to how that's implemented. All right, so I know this question came up uh, uh, from the audience. Basically, where do you, where is it best uh, to implement the join? And so you have several options and I'll just go back to KubeCloud to show you. Um, I could have implemented the join between say line items and products in this SQL statement uh, that creates kind of the base table for this queue. 
or I could have implemented it here as I did uh, in the joins block. Um, so the rule of thumb here is um, really it's what, what, what would be more flexible given the queries that you expect uh, to come from your end users. So if, for example, I expected line items to only be mapped to orders and never really queried in isolation, never really to be joined with other, uh, with data from other cubes, um, then I might prefer to just create that join within that, the, the main SQL statement of the, of the orders cube to join in the line items data. Um, because it's just, it, it might be simpler to just do that and define it in the SQL statement rather than to set up a separate cube, a separate entity. Um, but I would then lose that flexibility if I decide later that I want to join line items with something else or query you know, uh, more data just within the line items table. Um, so it's, it's kind of up to you, but just realize that some, some it would be more scalable uh, if you have a greater range of queries you'd expect uh, to have those joins defined uh, across cubes and to define separate cubes for, for those different tables. Um, so can think about what your end user is going to kind of expect and what, how they'll query your data. Um, another thing to note here is that pre-aggregations can be joined. So I don't know if we've mentioned anything about pre-aggregations yet in this talk, I kind of lost track, but um, just a reminder that pre-aggregations are how we, uh, one of the most powerful features of Cube for caching metrics data for your queries. So if you have, if you're worried about having, you know, pre-aggregations defined for different entities in your data model, uh, different cubes, um, don't worry, there's, there's the roll-up join option, which basically creates a rollup that can allow you, that allows you to join uh, data from different rollups across cubes. <clears throat> so that's, that's something to, to consider too. Um, I also saw some questions about the directionality of joins. Uh, so let's take this example. You have an orders and a customer's cube. Um, so which would be better uh, to join these two? Would it be better to have orders belongs to customers, and this is assuming we have multiple orders per customer, or should we have customers has many orders? Um, so, and, and I should note that it's not really recommended to define both relationships on the same queues because when Q uh, uh, looks for the join path between these, it won't be consistent in determining which, which path to take. And it does matter. Um, so let me just illustrate on on uh, cube cloud, how this matters. So in the orders cube, I have uh, a join defined with users. So uh, the user ID on each order maps to a user, an ID on the user's table, and it's a belongs to relationship. So, and I should note that in this data set, I have at least uh, one user who has zero orders. And if I do a query for that, and in this query, I'm going to look for the user's first name and last name uh, and filter on uh, order count equal to zero. If I do that, I, there's no data. And it looks like that data is missing to me. Um, but if I reverse the direction of the join, and those of you who are following along can try this out too. Uh, so if you're in development mode, you can remove uh, oh, sorry, let's remove this join. Actually, I'm going to cut that and paste it in the users cube. Uh, and I'm going to rename this because now I'm in the users cube. And this is a join with orders. Uh, oops. Remove that. Okay, so now I've uh, reconfigured the SQL state condition to be uh, joining the ID of this user's table to the user ID in the order's table. And I'm gonna change this to a has many relationship. And I'm gonna save that. So now the main table of this join is going to be on the orders queue. 
Okay, so if I rerun the same query that I had before, I should expect to see uh, the a result now because now the customer, uh, the join is on the user's table. So now customers with zero orders should appear as a record on that table. And yes, I do have one user, um, this user, Rasan Collins, uh, who has zero orders. Um, so that's, that's to illustrate how join directionality does matter in cube. And you do need to think about which way, how, which cube would have, oh, sorry, which cube would have the join defined? Because uh, that does impact your queries. Um, so uh, kind of related to that, uh, oh, sorry. Um, and actually, I'll just look over on the docs uh, since I use that as a reference here. Uh, so you may ask, uh, if I can't do this bidirectional join, how am I going to do basically a mini to mini relationship? And by that, I mean, like, if you have, say, for example, emails and transactions, and there are multiple emails for a given transaction, and there are multiple transactions for a given email. Um, so for that, uh, so, so while you can't define, or it's not recommended to define uh, uh, a join both ways on the same cubes, you can have, you can extend the cube or add a new cube to basically introduce the join in the other direction. So that's the general rule of thumb with many to many joins is that you need some sort of intermediate or associative table that allows you to map, uh, say, for example, in this example in the docs, we have emails. I think we introduced, yeah, we introduced a table for, or a cube for campaigns uh, and the mapping between those, here's a diagram that's good at illustrating it. Um, so we have a belongs to relationship between emails to campaigns uh, using the campaign ID mapping. Uh, and then we also have a has many relationship for campaigns to transactions so that we can now basically have that many to many relationship uh, existing between emails and transactions. So uh, this associative table could exist already in your source uh, database, uh, but if it doesn't, you can essentially create uh, a virtual uh, associative table uh, within Cube. And this, the docs goes over this example using uh, campaigns, which I have open here. Uh, and yeah, any, I guess, any questions about joins that I should answer before I move on? Oh, I guess um, I also saw someone ask if uh, SQL, if our SQL API will support joins. Uh, right now, it doesn't. So this is something important to note. We, we support joins for on our REST API, uh, but the SQL API, which was released last quarter, um, is, is not able to support joins yet, but that is something on our roadmap. Uh, for, for those of you who are using the, the SQL API for uh, BI tools like Superset, for example. Um, cool. yeah. yeah, and then there was one question that Igor, thanks for helping answer that is, are joins unidirectional or, or bidirectional? But <clears throat> um, just as a reminder, just, I mean, you need to define joining a single cube. Uh, I mean, that was basically a short answer from, mm -hmm. from Igor, but. Cool. Uh, if not, I'll move on. Uh, so, so we're now talking about query dependent data schema. Um, so I, the, here's a rule of thumb that I'll start with. We shouldn't let queries reshape your data in Cube. Uh, what we mean by that is like not recalculating the data with each query. Uh, so a good, good example would be, uh, let's say I need some metric uh, in this case, let's say counts, and we're going to, and, and we also depend, the count depends on certain filters in the query. Like, let's say it's a, a count of uh, a certain demographic per city, and we expect the user to be filtering based on cities um, to get those counts. Uh, so it wouldn't be ideal to calculate each count on the fly. Uh, depending on the, the incoming parameter, in this case, a city. Uh, it also wouldn't be ideal to really um, like add one, one count measure per filter option because that would, then you'd have a ton of measures, right, per city. 
Um, and I think it's important here to remember in general that cube is meant to optimize for queries. And I think that sometimes uh, I, I see uh, some folks have a tendency to think of cube uh, when they're first starting out as simply just like a SQL to JavaScript <laughs> translator. Um, and that that is like actually kind of a neat feature of cube. I remember thinking, oh, wow, that's that's quite interesting when I first you know started generating schema from SQL um, tables, but it's not the full pic picture. Uh, we're particularly interested in queries for metrics, um, which you can look at metrics in a very different perspective than you than you would for uh, raw, like let's say raw events data, uh, for example. Um, so how you would model data in cube really should be, you should constantly be thinking about how to optimize that model for your expected queries from users and not for the raw data uh, as you would you know, in, in the source database. So here's some things that I think would kind of change your perspective of data as a result. One is that calculations of metrics on the fly are expensive time-wise, um, and they, they can have a noticeable impact on your query performance. So you want to avoid doing these on the fly with each query. Um, and with Cube, you can implement things like pre-aggregations, which make these, these queries even faster uh, by, you know, by basically storing these results in, in a cache. Um, but these won't work if you need to recalculate the metric on each query. Uh, it's also not a lot of data that we're talking about compared to the raw data, because you're looking at metrics like counts and sums. So it's not, you know, if you have billions of, of records of data, for example, in the raw data set, and it's mostly events data, we're going to, you know, we're, the queries are mostly interested in, in counts of those or sums of those. And it's not, so you should be less afraid of having some redundancy here. Uh, if you're adding more dimensions to support like different filter parameters, uh, because again, we're, we're taking metrics, not raw data uh, and, and incorporating that, let's say into uh, your pre-aggregations. Um, so, you know, it, having the, 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 I guess the data model being dependent on the query that's prone to errors, it can lead to some unpredictable results. It's also, as I mentioned, not easy to cover those cases with pre-aggregation. So it's better to prepare your data to account for a filter dimension. Um, in, in the case where, where I gave earlier, where you have like a dimension of cities, um, this is a good recipe that uh, the DevRel team wrote up for um, basically reshaping the data, essentially joining it with itself. Um, so uh, using the cities uh, filter sort of as a dimension that you can then incorporate into each measure so that incoming queries uh, would um, be able to quickly find the record of data that maps to uh, whatever uh, whatever filter param was passed with respect to that query. Uh, so you're not recalculating, uh, for example, the, the number of people of a certain demographic within each city uh, each time you have that, that query incoming. Um, so that's, that's I hope that illustrates kind of it's it's I know it's tricky to get your mind around the first time, but once you start to play around more with cube and experiment with different combinations of dimensions and filters and whatnot, you'll start to see what I mean. Um, <clears throat> there is, I guess, one kind of I wouldn't call it an exception, but there is a a way though to think of uh, dynamic schema with query dependencies for the use case of multi-tenancy which we covered in quite some depth in our previous workshop. So I won't go into detail here, but if you are interested in how multi-tenancy works uh, with respect to uh, having dependencies embedded in the query, uh, so there are ways to use functions like query rewrite, compile context to implement say row level security or, or row level multi-tenancy or uh, da database by database multi-tenancy so if you're interested in that, I'd highly check out our, our previous workshop, but it outlines some of the best practices there to um, have queries uh, or how to structure your data based on queries in that use case. And I know we only have about five minutes left, so I'm gonna stop there and see if there's any last questions.
Yeah, I think there's one question on chat. Uh, it's like, how about data blending? Can it be done by joins or unions? Um, not sure if that you need any yeah, more context behind that yeah, question. Go, just, go ahead, Igor. Yeah, I think, I think we have enough context here. And you know, yeah. I'm glad to take the question because, well, basically, Cube has like, um, two ways to for you to implement data blending. So, so yeah, data blending basically uh, stands for this notion when you combine the data, the data link from from multiple sources like in parallel, uh, basically not joining them but bl like blending uh, often by time dim by time dimension. So yeah, uh, cube support like the first way cube supports is yeah as you as you mentioned like uh, using unions. So uh, we already had like a code example of that your cube can be defined like over select star from table union select star from another table and maybe maybe you can repeat unionizing your tables if you have like more of them and that's and then then your cube will be defined over this the combination um, of data from different tables that's one way to uh, to do that another way to do that would be uh, in a case when you have like multiple cubes defined and uh, they have time dimensions which you uh, and, uh, uh, and and if that's the case then you can use a special format uh, for for running your query i'll just share my screen for for a second so here's a part of our docs called like data blending and he, he, here's how you can issue a query which blends your data so you can see that well we're, you're you're providing providing an, an array of queries and uh, each one of them like the first one uh, contains a time dimension and it has its granularity and date range set to, to you know to the same values and that basically instructs cube to run both queries and to blend the data uh, together, so uh, so for uh, for you know same days in the result set that you'll be getting, you'll 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 have the values of revenue from the online orders cube, and also uh, revenue from retail orders. So this is another way to to do data blending with cube. And uh, well, uh, you should probably you should probably choose the way to implement it. You know according to according to whether you have like a separate cube or not, uh, like a couple of cubes or just, just if it is a single cube. If it's a single one, go with unions. If you already have like a few ones, uh, then probably the special format of query will, uh, uh, will well, set, up you for, set up you for success. And uh, I think there was really, really interesting question from, from Adam, like <laughs> about like common gotchas uh, with respect to performance. Cube. Well, it, it might be a really broad topic, but I'll just uh, like to outline like uh, a, a few things here. Uh, so I would say that uh, maybe it's not very common, but you know, um, but 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 really, um, yeah. But 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 for first gotcha would be just to not be using pre aggregations. Uh, this way, you 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 know your queries will be hitting the raw data. And uh, well, the performance will depend on you know, the performance of, of your of, of, the, of your data source, on the data layout, on the amount of data, on the shape of the query, all kinds of things. Uh, yeah. So uh, the first recommendation for for you to get like outstanding performance would be to just you know def declaratively define your pre aggregations and let Cube store uh, the pre aggregation data in Cube Cube store. You know. Uh, this is this is the solution to you know ninety percent of performance issues uh, with Cube uh, or even even more, and and then please please pay attention to different options that you can uh, use to set up your pre aggregations. First of all, if you have uh, if you have uh, you know uh, if you time dimensions in your data, if if it's time series data, it makes sense to uh, you know to to provide the right uh, granularity that would well basically um, allow to uh, to make the pre aggregations data uh, you know uh, short like smaller. Also, uh, you can you can you can you can partition your data uh, so to make sure that uh, Cube Store is able to uh, run your 
to, to execute your queries like massively in parallel. And that really helps with performance too. And also, um, um, and, all, and, and also make sure that if, if it's time series data, uh, your predications are set to be incrementally update, updated. It basically uh, means that uh, uh, Cube will, you know, uh, mm, Cube will run and update your predications uh, faster. So, so yeah, that's that's what I would like you know to take a look at and also uh like if if, if uh, by chance you're you're using cube in cube cloud which which you must might probably try to because well it has a free tire and it's really good for pocs like we've been doing in this workshop uh yeah you might we might also like to to to, to observe like the performance metrics and uh, different like recommendations of metadata and inspections that uh, that are available at the query tab or the pre-aggregation tab there yeah with, with that it would be much 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 easier to debug and optimize your query performance and yeah i can see that you already shared the screen i'll hand it over yeah. to you yeah, I mean, we're like, I mean, we had some technical difficulties earlier, so we're running a bit short of time, but just wanted to, uh, I mean, Igor and, and Ryan, I mean, thank you for great demos and presentations and you already referenced uh, both docs and our recipes. I definitely wanna encourage people to take advantage of those resources. It's usually a good starting point. Uh, there's a big section on schema and a lot of recipes that Igor and his team has written on, on data schema as well, along with other topics. So uh, those are probably a good place to start. Uh, but if anything's unclear, I mean, feel free to ask questions on Slack and we'll, we'll be happy to jump on. Um, I think we address all the questions over there. A couple of questions we needed a little bit more context on, but feel free to follow us, uh, follow up with us on, on Slack. Uh, a couple of things, I think some of the uh, code snippets that we put on the Notion page, we'll probably put it on on, on our uh, uh, QGIS repo in the next couple of days. So we'll, we'll get that uh, like we did in the last workshop, put that under the example folder so that people can use it as a reference for, uh, if you want to sort of redo those exercises on Cube Cloud deployments later on. Uh, and yeah, I mean, thanks for joining. Uh, I mean, thanks for s staying uh, staying on for over 90 minutes. Uh, 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 once again, I uh, uh, wish you a happy new year. I hope you got a lot out of this workshop and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. And yeah, and again, like if you want to provide us feedback uh, on the post event survey, we'll definitely appreciate it. And Ryan and Igor, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks. See you later.